Well, I want to thank you all so much for this uh, wonderful pilgrimage you have been on with me as we have looked at uh, uh, how to understand the Bible. I know this is not uh, an easy seminar in many ways because it tends to um, make us very conscious of how little we know about the Bible and how much we know about Mama, Baptist tradition, and Southern United States culture. <laughs> And therein is the issue. The issue is, um, I think we get too uh, bent out of shape over traditional issues and not bent out of shape enough over theological issues. And so I hope that this has uh, whetted your appetite for a personal pilgrimage and study as a Bible reader and interpreter. For all of us are going to stand before God for what we believe the Bible says and how we've lived it. It's kind of like uh, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You don't, have a, you don't have a question about that. The issue is what kind of light and what kind of salt will you be? There's the question. And the same is true with Bible interpretation. Everybody has to interpret the Bible. It's impossible. I just read it. No, you don't. Nobody just reads it. So we're looking at the how, the why, to try to be better Bible readers, Bible interpreters, and Bible livers, okay? They all go together. So if you look at the section called Application Tonight, uh, this is the fifth and sixth interpretive questions. You do remember there were seven interpretive questions, four reading cycles, and seven questions that I have tried to take uh, the uh, ancient Christian method from Antioch of Syria and put it into some modern structures so that uh, God's people today could benefit uh, from this approach. Uh, I want to read this little sentence, and I want to highlight these points. The then of Scripture must become the now of illumined understanding, proclamation, and lifestyle. It's not enough to understand what the Bible said. It's not enough to fully understand Paul. It's not enough to be a historian. We must take the then of inspired revelation and bring it into the today of Christian living. And I, I think if we just leave it in theology, leave it in the ivy tower, leave it in the seminary, leave it in Sunday school, we don't understand the purpose of Bible study. The purpose of Bible study is to inform us so as to change us so as to help us be Christ-like in our day. Now, if you look at number B, and I've met people like this, you've met people like this, there are personal factors that affect Bible application. And the personal factors are a personal need. I mean, how many people have some crisis in their life and they're looking everywhere in the Bible to find it and suddenly they find that an answer in strange places? We are desperate, desperate to know the will of God and how to live. Now, the Bible answers some questions really well, and the Bible does not address other questions. And uh, I think that's confusing to us. We want it to answer every little question about every little thing, and it does not. Now, it does give us principles, and we do have the Holy Spirit, and we have to make some... Uh, um, informed judgments on how we ought to live. So personal need does affect how we interpret the Bible. A personal a situation, where you are, what you're looking for. Personal level of maturity. Now you know that when God deals with baby Christians, he bends over backwards to communicate with them. I mean, he'll let them flop the Bible open to a verse. He'll let them put their finger on it. He'll do all kind of things. But now that you've gone through this seminar, you'll never be able to do that again. In some ways, I have not done you a favor in this seminar because what I've done, for those of you who've come, is I've made you responsible to stand before God for what you believe the Bible says and how you got it. I'm not sure that's always a blessing. Number three, number four, personal desire to know God. Let me ask you, why do you want to know the Bible? You just want to show off in Sunday school? You want to beat the in-laws at Bible trivia? You want to argue the Methodists down? Why do you want to know the Bible? I think that's a valid question. 
And if it's a me-centered answer, I'm not sure the Lord's going to give it to you. The more we know, the more we want to give ourselves to Him. We are called to Christ-likeness, not to personal knowledge. People say to me a lot, Oh, I wish I had your Bible knowledge. Really? Well, if you did, you can't sit in a pew anymore. Why don't you come to me with Nicaragua and Costa Rica next month? Why don't you start a 40-year study of the Bible? Why don't you get involved in personal events? You want to know what the Bible says? Then you, to whom much is given, what we want is a pill. Give me a pill so I'll know as much as you know tomorrow. It doesn't come tomorrow. It doesn't come in 10 years. But I guarantee you, a knowledge of the Bible is such a peace when the world is screaming, God said you ought to do this. Don't do this. To know the Bible is a peace amidst the confusions in the church, in the religious community. I pray for you, not that we agree, but that you know Scripture well enough to live a life pleasing to Him. Cultural and denominational traditions. Thank God we don't have any of those. My big fear is when we don't know the difference between a real issue of Bible interpretation and an issue of cultural, denominational Christianity. And finally, current historical situations. I was talking with a brother before a service and asked me about Israel. Is Israel in the news today a part of prophecy? <laughs> I think not. Now, if you think yes, then I would say to you that you're taking the New Testament and the Old Testament particularly and putting it against the modern newspaper, which is a tragic way of interpreting the Bible. And every generation's done that. I, mean, I hate to tell you, but your generation's just not that hot. Your history's just not Bible prophecy. What happens to happen in your day is not ultimate, universal. People have struggled with these questions for a thousand years. What makes you so hot? Why is American Christianity the essence of this? See, I think we have not thought through this well. Number C, I want to read this. This is from a wonderful book I had in seminary by Bernard Ram, who I really like. Um, this is a hard book to read, but it's called Protestant Biblical um, Interpretation. It's a, it was a textbook in seminary when I was there, but he's going to quote uh, the Danist existentialist Kierkegaard uh, about interpretation and application. Listen to this. I always cry when I read this, but I hope I don't. According to Kierkegaard, the grammatical, lexical, and historical study of the Bible was necessary but preliminary to the true reading of the Bible. To read the Bible as God's Word, one must read it with his heart in his mouth, on tiptoe, with eager expectancy in conversation with God. To read the Bible thoughtlessly or carelessly or academically or professionally is not to read the Bible as God's Word. As one reads it as a love letter is read, then one reads it as the Word of God. Now, some possible guidelines for application because this is, um, we're not talking about Scripture here. We're talking about how to know what Scripture means and how to apply Scripture to our day. Now, here are the two problems. Number one, every Scripture has one meaning, which is the intent of the original author speaking to the people who would first read this Bible book. Okay? One meaning but many significances or applications of that meanings to other cultures. Now, the other aspect is this. Some things in the Bible are cultural. The Bible records some things that it does not advocate. How do I know the difference between the eternal principles and the cultural husk of the day into which the Bible was given to the hands of the church? And this, of course, is the issue of slavery and women and riding donkeys and living in tents and on and on. So here's, here's just my thoughts on this to try to bring some structure to this. A, 
Be sure to apply the major intent of the author as expressed in... Now, follow me again. The major intent of the original, the only inspired person in this process. First, you have to know what the whole book is talking about. That will limit what each of the parts can say. What is the whole book about? What is the literary unit in which you find your text... And what does the paragraph say in which your text is found? So there's an overall meaning to the book, a meaning to the literary unit, and the purpose of the paragraph, and never should we do less than a paragraph. Because a paragraph is the only piece of literature where words have meaning in sentences and sentences only have meaning in paragraphs. B, I want to read this again. Please follow with me. Be careful of arbitrary principalizing. Now, some people find a principle in every text. There are not principles in every text. And some of them base it on very ambiguous text. I would say, if you're going to principalize the Bible, and we must, particularly the Old Testament, do it on clear teaching passages. I want to make a quote here. This is a quote from Hard Sayings of the Bible, a wonderful text uh, for teachers on every difficult and controversial text from Genesis to Revelation. It costs $40 by conservative international authors. The effort to discern between those things which are culturally and historically relative and those which are transcendent is an, act, is an actuality engaged in by all Christians in one way or another. At issue is only whether such discernment results from our likes and dislikes, our own cultural conditioning and prejudices, or whether it is the application of a clear principle that emerges from a proper understanding of the nature and purpose of Scripture. Not every verse is a universal principle. You just can't imagine the problem of saying the Bible says it, that settles it in some areas. Number C, all truth must be applied. But check with the believing community before you jump off the roof. Now what I mean by that is, God did not just speak to you or speak to me or speak to Baptists. God has been revealing himself for thousands of years. Do you not think that God has spoken to other people and it's significant what he said to them? Yes, we first must come to the Bible ourselves and struggle with the history and struggle with the context and struggle with the grammar and struggle with the word meaning and struggle with the parallels. But there comes a point when we say, God... This is what I think you're saying. Has your church understood this? I usually tell young preachers, if you find something in a verse that nobody in the history of the church has ever seen, take two Tylenol PM, and when you wake up, read it again. Now, it's possible God's going to reveal a brand new truth to you. He's done that in times, but it's probably not true. And we can all benefit from the understanding of the great Christians of the, of the ages. Amen? None of us are an island unto ourselves. I would say in a local setting, check with your Sunday school teacher. Check with another Sunday school teacher you know and like. Check with your pastor. Check with mature Christians you trust and see what they see on this text. I think it's helpful. Number D, application of... Now I'm going to scream this. I'm not going to, but I wish I could. Watch me jumping up and down right now. The application of one biblical passage should never violate another passage. Believers do not have the right to choose some text and ignore other text. Texts have priority for Christians, not personal preferences, denominational conditioning, and cultural insights. Texts are inspired, and all of us are sinful. I would say the New Testament takes precedent over the old. 
Now, by that I mean, and this is an issue, and several of you have asked me about this. I know this is, is something that comes up when I, when I preach because um, in your mind, I'd appreciate the Old Testament. I do believe that the Old Testament is not the central truth of the New Testament. I believe that Jesus is the central truth of the New Testament. I believe that we should not read the, Old, the New Testament through the eyes of the Old Testament. We should read the Old Testament through the new revelation of the New Testament. That the New Testament is the last and complete word from God in Jesus Christ. I put it another way. There is the written word and there is the living word. And the living word has priority over the written word. Now, if you don't believe that, I hope you'll read Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 48 again, where Jesus said over and over, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, where he negates Old Testament text, reinterprets current understandings, and puts himself as Lord of Scripture. Now, if Jesus is Lord of Scripture, then Matthew becomes priority over Leviticus. You heard the story about the storm that was coming to an island. And the guy had a copy of Isaiah and a copy of Leviticus. And he only had one bottle. He could only save one of them. Which one do you save? Well, you save Leviticus because he's read Isaiah. <laughs> Number E. I got this from a little book called How to Interpret the Bible by Mayhew. It's a good little paperback book. It's out of print, but you can get it on anything on these books you can get on Amazon. And he gave, gives some questions that we ought to ask every text when it comes time to try to apply this. For a Sunday school teacher, after you have studied, for a preacher, after they have prepared, these are the kind of questions that must be asked on how do I take this truth from a historical plane and put it on the streets, put it into contemporary meaning. How do I make this relevant? Here are the questions. Are there examples to follow? Are there commands to obey? Are there errors to avoid? Are there sins to forsake? Are there promises to claim? Are there new thoughts about God to analyze? And are there principles by which to live? Now, those are some very simple but very practical, um, I think, helpful application uh, questions. Now, Roman numeral three, your responsibility your responsibility as an interpreter in the application of biblical truth. Number one, you must walk in the light you have. And I say this, and I want you to think through what I'm implying by this. I believe that believers will only stand before God for what they understood about his will and how they lived it. I do not think that God will hold us responsible for what we did not and do not fully comprehend because this is a covenant of human responsibility. If there is no responsibility, there is no commensurate justice on the part of God for that which I did not understand. Now, you may say, well, that should, I ought to quit reading the Bible today. No, no, see, that didn't answer it. Because we're all going to stand before God. And the more light you have, the less you're influenced by the overabundance of performance Christianity, rules Christianity, and denominational Christianity. I use a little example here. You see it in the notes called wearing jewelry, Romans 14.23. I'm sure you're wondering what in the world that is. This is my little hypothetical situation. You're a high school young lady, Christian, and uh, you dress like the other high school young ladies in the church, you wear makeup, fix your hair, wear nice clothes, and you go to school with a Pentecostal young lady who is not able to wear makeup, wear jewelry, wear nice clothes. Her hair is always in a certain way. Her clothes are always long. And the Pentecostal girl says to you, man, I love your clothes, I love your jewelry, I love your makeup. The worst possible thing you could do to that Pentecostal girl is say, here, borrow mine. Because if, now you have a right to explain to her, if you know, why you think that's okay, the wearing of jewelry and the braiding of hair from the pastorals. But you don't have the right to give her 
freedom to violate her conscience. Romans 14, 23 is very specific. If it does not issue from faith, it is sin. Which means until we think through our traditions, to violate them is a sin. But when we think through of them, many of them have nothing to do with the Bible and we can shed them as cultural Christianity. B, share your insight from the Scripture in love. Ephesians 4, 15. <laughs> it's really important. Arrogance, dogmatism, and I know more than you, nanny nanny boo boo, is always out of place among the people of God. Because the ones who think they know are the ones who scare me the most. So you're the standard, and what you believe is what God believes. And if we don't conform to your standard, then we're somehow the will of God. Who do you think you are? It is the down part of evangelical conservatism. C, always be open to new light from the Bible and the Spirit. Believers must continue to grow. I say to folks, you know that I kind of use the donkey and the two-by-four method of teaching. I, know, I think you know that, right? If you have not had a new thought about God or the Bible or Jesus or Christianity in the last five years, you are brain dead. You don't reach a plane and then, boy, the rest of your life you just stay on that plane. We're always growing. None of us have arrived. When none of us fully understand. None of us got it right. It's always a climb in this life. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? You're not the judge of anything, you big weenie you. That would solve so many problems in the church. We begin to think, well, I believe exactly what so-and-so, or I... Well, don't you see the problem here? Don't fight over minor points. Baptist, 14.1 of Romans. Accept weaker brothers without disputing doubtful points. We do not accept people because they agree with us. We accept people because Christ accepted people. And God's people will not and do not and cannot agree on all this. And pluralism is not a sign of sin. It's a sign of humanity. Do not nitpick each other to death. Second, we all have strengths and weaknesses. Freedom is not a, lion, a license. You know, there's two groups in Romans 14, 1 through 15, 13. Weak brothers who are influenced by their pagan past, a lot of superstition, a lot of fear, and free brothers who understand that the gospel really sets them free. But the free brothers cannot live in such a way as to hurt or violate weak brothers. And the text that grabs me is, in Romans 14, will you, for your so-called freedom, destroy the person for whom Christ died? Does your freedom give you a right to run over other believers? It does not. We are in this thing together. We are in the body of Christ, and we must apply the Bible in such a way as the body is healthy and grows not personal preference, family traditions, or denominational indoctrination. Amen or oh me. The next section of the seminar is called Possible Pitfalls. I want to continue a bit. I need a little more time. I wish you'd look at the top of this section. I want to really highlight these three aspects of what I'm trying to say to you. Please remember that Bible interpretation is a logical process. What I've been saying to you is four reading cycles and seven questions. A textually focused method. Show me what the paragraph says. Show me what the literary unit says. Show me what the book is about. Show me the grammar. Show me the words, their meaning. Show me the parallels. Show me the, the parallel passage. Don't you see what I'm saying? It's a logical process 
applied to a textual focus. The focus is text. Texts have priority over everything and everyone because texts are inspired. Interpretations are not inspired. And third, a spirit-led teachability. The more you know, the more you know you don't know. God deliver all of us from sophomore seminary attitudes. Second year of seminary, you think you know everything. Wait till you get in a church, friend. Document this evidence. How do we document this evidence? Our biblical interpretation should be logical and textual to explain to another normal Christian what we believe and why. Our focus should be able to understand the Bible in such a way that if someone says to us, can you tell me what you believe about that? What you think? We ought to be able to explain what we believe and where we get it in such a way that a normal, non-seminary, non-PhD person understands what we're saying. Now, how do we do that? We do it by taking good notes when we study the Bible. So let me document this a bit. Documenting your textual evidence, note-taking. Number one, what kind of book are you trying to interpret? Please deliver me from trying to make Revelation literal. Please deliver me from trying to make parables historical narrative. Please deliver me from building doctrine solely on Hebrew poetry. B, from the literary context of the passage, the immediate text, the paragraph, the surrounding paragraphs, the literary unit, and the whole book. It just got to be done. From the historical setting of the book, who is the author? Who were the original hearers? What, why did they write this? What occasioned this? What is the problem? What is the need? What is the crisis? And finally, when was this written? Why do we do all that? Now, we can't always be certain. We're trying to realize that the original hearers are the key to modern interpretation. What could the original hearers have understood? That's why I keep saying this, the book of the Revelation, the book of the Revelation is primarily a word of encouragement to suffering Christians of the first century, not a road map for Christians in the 21st century. Revelation was not written to you. It was written to these dying Christians. It has to have an application to the first century. Now, it may have another application for the last generation, sure. It may have an application for every... But the place to start your interpretation is not the morning newspaper. It's the historical setting of the Christians under either Nero or Dimension, uh, uh, Dominion. Um, the grammatical structure. Um, are there unusual features in this text? What is the verb tense? Are there parallel clauses? Um, these are things you have to look at. Uh, what, are these, what are these words about? Uh, the words. What does this word mean in this context? Uh, what, what did this word meant to the original hearers? I remember a, um, I was kidding with somebody on a mission trip somewhere in Central America, and this, this Spanish-speaking person said to me, please don't molest me. Whoa! For an American, molest has a whole different context. Amen? That has sexual connotations. For him, the Spanish word molest just meant you're picking on me. You're kidding with me. But for me, that thing had huge connotations. You don't think those Bible verses have connotations? You don't think some of those words carry meanings with them? Agape? Pistis? Huge meanings are coming with that. From parallel passages. And again, this is this concentric circles of, of significance from the, the same literary unit to the same author, the same book to the same author to other authors of the same period, the same genre, the same subject, and to the whole Bible. Number three. Now, this is where I told Peggy, she asked me, she's, I just love my wife so much. She said, well, how are you? I said, well, I'm a little nervous because I'm about to get in some really controversial things. She said, they've heard it from you before. Okay, Peg. Beginning in number three, I want to bring some... This is where, if you have, uh, 
it depends on what kind of thinker you are. If you're a conceptual thinker, you've enjoyed my presentation to some extent. But if you are a textual thinker, now I'm about to get your juices flowing because I'm about to mention some texts, and I'm, I bet you that you were not going to agree with me. Well, you're not on some of these texts. Now, the issue is not whether you agree or not. The issue is, do you see where I'm coming from and where I am a, I am a conservative Bible teacher? And just because you haven't seen it this way or haven't heard it this way doesn't mean that I'm wild-eyed. You may be trapped in tradition. God forbid. So let me have the freedom to say with the passion I want to and you have the freedom to go, Pfft. all right? Abuse of, of, because of presuppositions that teachers come to the Bible knowing what it should say and must say before they ever read the Bible, which of course affects what the Bible can say. The first one I want to use is William Barclay. He's dead now. He was a wonderful uh, word study person. I think he taught in England. I forgot at what school, Cambridge or Oxford or one of those. And he put out a little thing called uh, Daily Bible Study, so popular in America in, in the last 50 years for sure. Little blue, bluish gray books. Wonderful word studies. But William Barclay was a logical positivist, which means he denied miracles. He tried to explain every miracle away because miracles didn't happen. So when it comes to Jesus feeding the large group, this is Barclay's answer. Well, the little boy brought his loaves and fish, and everybody said, oh, isn't that sweet? He shared his lunch. We'll share our lunch. And that's how they were fed. Oh, yuck. Where did the 12 basketfuls of bread they took up afterwards come from? Jesus walked on the water Oh, not because he could walk on the water. He knew where the sandbar was. Peter didn't. Peter fell in the hole. Peter, okay, okay. If you believe miracles can't happen, you can't interpret the Bible properly. Number two, bias against women in ministry. People say to me, we ain't going to deacons. Well, let me just ask you a question. Now, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. I don't care if you have women deacons or not, but I'm telling you this. If the Bible has women deacons, you can't be that dogmatic. If the Bible, which is the only source for faith and practice, has a deacon, it's called Phoebe in Romans 16, 1, who are you to say the church can't have women deacons? The other thing is, there are women's deacons, I think, mentioned in 1 Timothy 3, 11. King James says deacons' wives, but if you look at the textual marker, we're introducing a third group, which I call the widow's role, which is women over 60 who have no family that the church hired to do ministry to women. You say, well, I don't agree with that. See, it doesn't matter what you agree or don't agree. You're not the authority. Neither am I. But if a text is an authority, and I have several texts, you've got to look at my text. But that's not what we do. What we do is, Baptists don't do that. Oh, that settles it. I don't agree with that. Well, who are you? Who am I? Text or priority. But have you checked the text? I don't think we check the text. We check the church constitution. Where is the authority? Oh, we're Bible people, are you? Good, I am too. Let's talk about it. Bias concerning church polity. Congregationalism is the best. Oh, I could throw up. You Baptists. Catholics tell me theirs is the best. Presbyterians tell me theirs is the best. The Congregationalist tells me they're the best. All three church polity farms are clearly seen in the Jerusalem Council of Acts 15. You got James, leader of the whole deal. You got a group of elders they talk to that vote. Then the whole church confirms it. You can't proof text one place and say Baptists are just right because they vote on everything. As a pastor, the greatest disaster in most of my church life has been Baptists voting on things. Because most of them are weak Christians, baby Christians, self-centered Christians, and what's in it for me, Christians? I don't think democracy is a biblical issue. Text are biblical issues. I'm over it. A bias concerning all true believers must speak in tongues. 
I'm so tired of being called a second-class Christian by charismatics. First, I've showed it to you. First Corinthians 12, 29 and 30, a series of questions with a may particle that means the author expects a no answer. And one of those questions is, all do not speak in tongues, do they? And the answer is no, all do not speak in tongues. And then just a few chapters later, in the same literary unit, Paul says in 1439, do not forbid them to speak in tongues. It's not for everybody, obviously. It is for some, obviously. You say, we don't do it here, so we don't allow it. So tell me where the authority is. What you do and don't do, what Baptists do and don't do, are text. No, come on, where is the authority? Is the Bible the only source for faith and practice, or do we all get to vote on it? The abuse of context by proof texting. God have mercy on us. I think I've told you about number one. This is the top knots taken out of King James in Matthew 24, 17, where it says women can't let their hair down in church. Have to have that top knot. And they cut the front of the verse off and the back of the verse, and it says in King James, if you see the abomination of desolation coming, i.e. Titus, do not go down into your house to get your cloak. Go over the wall and run to the hills. And they cut off the front of the verse that has to do with the judgment on Jerusalem and the Christians fleeing, and they cut, cut the second half of the verse off. And now Matthew 24, 17 becomes hairstyle of women in the 20th century. God have mercy. And the women bought it. The tragedy is not only the proof texting and literalizing of the preacher, but the fact that Christian women did not have the understanding of the Bible to walk in the freedom of Christ. Rule focused legalism, Colossians 2.21. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. How many times have I heard that preached in Baptist life? And if you read the context of two, I think it starts in 16 through 23, 21 is a quote from the false teachers that Paul is repudiating and we quote the verse on the false teacher's bad message and preach it in God's name because we don't know context. The plan of salvation. The closing point of the plan of salvation. Now, these are godly people that I'm talking about, but this is bad interpretation. Bill Bright, forever, his four spiritual laws, and Billy Graham on how to have a fully meaningful life, always use their fourth point that you must personally receive Christ. And they always use Revelation 3.20. Yea, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I'll come in and sup with him and him with me, King James. I always wonder what dinner had to do with getting saved. That can't be a salvation verse because Revelation chapters 2 and 3 is letters to the seven churches. But if, a, if an evangelical has got to have a personally received verse, he can just get it anywhere they want. They can just run to the Bible and pick and choose. It's for good motive, it works, it's practical. Oh, so Bible interpretation is ba based on what's practical. It's not based on context of the original author, it's based on what works. And we say, well, see, Jesus is standing at the door of your heart and knocking. That text doesn't say he stands at the door of your heart. The Bible doesn't say Jesus bite Jesus into your heart. That's a modern way that we say it. I think it's not bad. It's just not a biblical way of saying it. What about the Roman road? 323, 58, 623. But we believe you've got to personally receive Christ. I certainly believe that. But Paul doesn't talk about that in Romans 1 through 8. He doesn't bring up you've got to personally receive Christ there. So people jump to the literary unit dealing with what about unbelieving Israel? Romans 9, 10, and 11. And jump into one passage in Romans 10 right in the middle of Israel and pulls out, whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved, which is a quote from the Old Testament, and suddenly now they have the plan of salvation. And if we go ask Roman Catholics questions that they never heard, and they give us an answer that we're not trained in, then suddenly they're lost because they don't agree with our plan.
Baptism for the dead. All of these sites on ancestries are from the, are from the Mormon church. That baptized for the dead based on 1 Corinthians 15, 29. I have no idea what that means. There are no parallel passages. You can look at it. I, the early church didn't know what that means. If you read the Ananicene Fathers, I, this is so, so unbelievable. They didn't know what to do with this verse, so when an old Christian died, they baptized new Christians over the grave of old Christians to symbolize someone taking his place. The one I really like, and this is in the Ananicene Fathers documented, you can check it out. They used to not baptize somebody until they went through catechism. That used to take 18 months. They wouldn't baptize you early like the New Testament because they were afraid you'd mess up. So you've got to prove yourself, then they'll baptize you. Well, what if you die in the 18 months? You've got to be baptized. So they put the dead guy in a room, put a young guy under the dead guy. The elders walk in and say, Brother Jones, would you like to be baptized? This brother's dead. He's already there. And the guy under the table goes, Yeah! And they take the guy under the table and baptize him for dead Brother Jones. Early church struggling with this text. We're going to let Mormons pull this text out and make it baptism for the dead based on this one proof text? When if you take the paragraph, which is about the resurrection... And this paragraph on the resurrection has four evidences for the resurrection. This is one of four evidences. And even if I don't know what this one means, I know what the other three mean, and I know the resurrection is true, and it has nothing to do with baptism for the dead. How about dispensational proof text? You say, they got one? You bet your bippy like all of us have them. 2 Timothy 2.15 this was even a title of one of Schofield's books, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. And this says, Rightly Dividing the Word. has nothing to do with the theory of dispensations. Nothing! But it says dividing, and that kind of sort of maybe could be fit, so we're going to quote it as a proof text. How about the Roman Catholic transubstantiation? That when the, when the wafer and the wine are lifted, it actually becomes the body and blood of Christ. Where do they get that from? They get it from John chapter 6, which is not the Lord's Supper at all. This is early in Jesus' ministry. This is not the upper room. This is a mass feeding. And these people want a new Moses who will feed them like the old Moses fed them. Bring down some manna and we'll believe in you. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Eat me. I am the blood of the new covenant. Drink me. And we take that literally in a context that has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper and we let people proof text that as the method of salvation. What is the matter with us? We don't know how to interpret our Bibles. We let people say, read that right there. What does that say? What does that say? That settles it. It does not. It starts it. Personal leisure. This one, I was in uh, the chapel at ETBU. I remember this day so well. I didn't see this one myself. It was pointed out. And somebody said, uh, be still and know that I am God. Now, you know that text? You heard that? You ever quoted that? Is that Psalm 46.10? Be still and know that I am God. Yes, I've been kind of uh, stressed out lately. I've been working too much, going to church too much, uh, doing too much. So God just wants me to chill out on the back porch, maybe in Jamaica, just kind of get in my little chair and sit there on the ocean and go, oh, just contemplate who Jesus is, who God is. I, I'm just meant to relax. Would you read the next verse, please? Would you read the next verse of be still and know that I am God in Hebrew parallelism and it says, I will be exalted in all the earth? That is nothing on an American issue to take a vacation. That's a text on the Great Commission. And we've turned it into leisure. Don't you see what we're doing? Our interpretation says far more about us than it does about God. Our handling the Bible tells exactly who we are, but very little who God is. Because we know what the Bible's supposed to say before we read it, and we only read the parts that agree with us. Well, I feel like I've uh, 
cannot finish this section tonight. I will finish this section tonight. And next week we'll get into the procedural message, which is kind of an overview. Next week I will talk about the place of the Holy Spirit in Bible interpretation. I've left it off till now. It is a crucial thing. It's just hard to lock down. Uh, I think I can get through this in one more section. I hope so. Um, now I hope to that tonight that you've allowed me the freedom to... Uh, what word should I use? Upset you? challenge you, uh, confront you, uh, make you uncomfortable. You're saying, you're, you're tearing up everything I've heard. That's the problem. Because what made you think that what you heard was scriptural authority? And do you have the gumption, the fortitude, the spiritual wisdom to say, I'm going to check the Bible about everything I've been told that it says. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to be vulnerable for Scripture? Or have you got everything so locked down, so settled, so in place, so much in a systematic theology, you cannot allow anybody challenge anything to make you uncomfortable? It's been said, and I believe it's true, the Bible makes the uncomfortable comfortable. And the comfortable uncomfortable. I believe we've got a church, not you, America, a church full of baby Christians who whine all the time and don't have a clue about the truth of the New Testament. And you break one of their little rules and they'll crucify you. They'll split the church. They'll kick you out over something that has nothing to do with the Bible and everything to do with 20th century America or 20th century evangelicalism. I promise you God was doing quite well before Baptists came on the scene in the 1600s, and he'll do quite well when they're gone. And he was doing quite well before we ever heard the name evangelical, and he'll do quite well when they're gone. Everything but Scripture will pass away, and Scripture is the only source for faith and practice. God have mercy on us all.